Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Zenith 750 Super Duty build. In my last video, I talked about how I primed, or I, I showed you that I primed my parts, and I didn't realize that I was supposed to show you how I primed them and completely forgot. It's kind of like if I was producing a movie, I'd forget to film the scene that explains the plot of the movie. So in this uh, beginning part of this video, I'm gonna show you, I just have a random bulkhead here from the fuselage. I'm going to prime it and I'll show you the steps I use to go ahead and prime a part. All right, I've already deburred the holes in here and I've cleaned up the edges. So this part's ready to go as far as prepping for priming. What I do is I usually use the maroon colored scotch brake pads and I actually just ordered a whole nother box, but I'm out of them. And I, but I had some of these green ones. They're pretty much the same thing. I don't think I noticed any difference, but what I'm gonna do is just go ahead throughout the surface of the whole thing, including the flanges and just scuff it up. Now, keep in mind, there's a difference between sanding and scuffing. The only thing I'm doing is putting, I don't know if they're microscopic, but little tiny scratches in the aluminum. And what that does, it just scuffs up the surface or roughs up the surface to give that primer a mechanical bond to the aluminum. I guess the chemicals in the primer will give it a chemical bond. And I think this just helps give it a little bit of a mechanical bond to help it stick better. So I'll go through the outside and the inside, just kind of scuffing it up. Now, after I've scuffed up the part, the idea now is to clean it as clean as I can get it so that there's no oil or grease on it for the primer. And that's why I'm wearing rubber gloves. I don't want the oils from my fingers to get on the surface. And there's a couple ways you can do this. Uh, right now, I'm just using some alcohol to wipe it down. You can use lacquer thinner or mineral spirits or even soapy water works too. The idea is just to get it clean. And you can see on here how, how dirty that gets after s sanding it. So I'll just go through the whole thing with some alcohol right now and get it all cleaned up as clean as I can. And then it's ready for primer. Now keep in mind, there's a lot of different primers that you can use. You can buy a gallon of epoxy primer from somewhere like Superflight and that's probably a more cost efficient way of, of doing this. I like these little cans because they're just quick and easy. I don't have to mix up paint. I don't have to clean the paint gun. It's just shake them up and spray, but it does cost a lot more. These cans are between eight and $10 a can. And the two that I have here, I have Duplicolor self-etching primer, and then I have one from Ace Hardware, it's Rust-Oleum. They both work really nice. I've used a Rust-Oleum in the rudder for the Super Duty. But the only problem I found with the Rust-Oleum is the spray pattern is like an inch and a half circle. So if you're doing a larger part, it's kind of hard to, to cover it with just a circle spray pattern. Whereas the Duplicolor seems to spray more in an oval pattern like a normal spray can would. So on this one, I bought a bunch of cans of the Duplicolor. And just to give you an idea of how much you're going to use, in just the skeleton for the stabilizer, I used four cans of this primer. And I only put on light coats, so it takes a lot of primer, which can be very expensive. One of the things I wanted to mention is, I'm not yet sure exactly how I'm gonna prime the rest of this airplane. I don't know if I'm going to keep buying these cans of primer, or I may purchase from Zenith a product called Cortex or Cortex. And, and what it is, I think you get it in like a gallon or a quart can, and you can just brush it on the mating surfaces. So like anytime aluminum goes up against another piece of aluminum is where you really, if you're going to prime, that's probably all you really need to prime. Um, you can just brush it on and then not prime like this surface. So that may be something I do in the future. I'm not exactly sure, but for right now on my stabilizer and probably the elevator, I'm just spraying with these cans of, of uh, Duplicolor self-etching primer. This primer goes on extremely thin. So it usually takes maybe two or three coats or passes over the same area to get a you know, nice coverage. And I use this hair dryer which one of my ex-girlfriends left at my house and I decided to keep because it will dry the primer almost instantly. Now it won't fully cure it, but it dries it to the touch and it dries it enough in between coats that I can dry it. That coat is pretty much dry and then I can put on another quick coat. 
it just makes putting on the different coats of primer faster and easier. Well, and here we have a nicely primed part ready to install. Now with this primer, that hair, hair dryer will dry it to the touch pretty much instantly, but it still takes about 24 hours for it to fully cure. But what I've noticed is after about 24 hours or whatever they say it takes to dry, you know, if you're not careful, you can still scratch it. But if you let it dry for like a week or two weeks or as time goes on, it seems to really harden up and it's very, very difficult to scratch it. So, um, you know, you might want to prime your parts a few days before you're going to actually use them. So now this one, when I actually get to the fuselage, will be all ready to go. Well, that's enough about priming. What do you say we get back to building? Let's get started with preparing the forward attach brackets for the horizontal stabilizer. Now, something I wanted to point out is you do need to be careful with hole sizes. That's why these plans are very important. So this is the front bracket for the horizontal stabilizer. And you can see the very top and bottom are A6 rivets. If you go to number four down here, it shows you number four here is an A6 rivet. There's four, one, two, three, four, there's two brackets. So on the bracket here, they're all drilled out for A5 rivets, but this one and this one will need opened up to 3 16 to accommodate the A6 rivet. So always check your plans for the correct rivet size because not every hole in every single part is drilled to the, the final size. So to drill out these holes, I wanted to make sure they remain perfectly straight through the part. So I used a drill press instead of just using a hand drill. And of course, anytime we drill a hole, we wanna make sure we deburr it so that there is no burrs on that hole. And you can see it just takes a, a half a spin of this tool. That one looks great. And then we have this one. All right, this is the bracket that goes on the front spar and it connects to the spar like that. So we just drilled this hole and this hole out to 3 16 So now obviously this hole and this hole will also be required to be drilled out to 3 16 All right, let's see where I'm at right now. The first step on this page is checked off, so it's done. Clico the rib nose to the front spar. That little rib right there is the rib, or the nose rib. That's Clico to the front spar. And then it says, work with the spar upside down on the workbench. Clico the full rib at the end of the front spar. And as you can see, the horizontal stabilizer is upside down. I've Clicoed on both of the end ribs. It's just a matter of just putting two Clicos in there. And in the next step, it says, Clico the ribs between the spars. So let's do that. Now here's something interesting about these four ribs. These ribs look like they're perfectly symmetrical, but they're actually not. So there's actually a front and a back. Now the way you tell which side is the front is if you line it up with a, a rib like this, it'll be perfectly even with the top. If you have it backwards here, it's very, very slightly different. It's tiny bit different, you're not even be noticed it, you won't even be able to notice it on the camera. Uh, but so this is the way it goes. And I've also noticed that these holes are a little bit different than these. So if you do put it on backwards, you're not gonna be able to get the Clicos in. So there's two ways to tell which way it goes. One is to line it up here, and then one is if your holes don't line up perfectly, you've got it on backwards. I'm just putting two Clicos in the front and two Clicos in the back for each rib. These are the black 532nd Clicos. So in building this airplane, you're, go you're going to want to make sure you have a lot of the black, gold, and maybe silver Clicos. I'm not sure you need too many of the silver Clicos on this airplane, but it's always good to have as many as you can. You can't have too many Clicos.
Now the next step in a manual is to rivet these supports on here. And one thing I wanted to mention about rivets is when you look at a rivet, let's take this one here. I believe this head right here is called the, the uh, formed head or the, the manufactured head. And then when you squeeze the rivet, this was called the, the shop head. So this part here, you always want to put, if you can, you always want to put it on the thinner material. So since this doubler is the thinnest part of this bracket, I'll rivet these from behind and then the shop head will be on the thick part, which is the, the bracket. You also notice that obviously I'm going to have to use a pneumatic squeezer for these big rivets. And to get the squeezer in here, I've taken this rivet here that's supposed to be right here. And I've just taken the Clecos out and just pushed it back to get it out of the way. Well, now that I'm done with the big pneumatic riveter, I'm just sliding this rib back in place and I'll put the Clecos back in because I think the next step is actually riveting these ribs to the front and rear spars. Again, my pneumatic squeezer was too big to fit beside this rib, so I used my manual squeezer. But I was kind of a moron, and when I used this, I put a big scratch on the, uh, the, the primer on the rib. And so for all the other ones I did after that, I added a paper towel between the squeezer and the rib, and I'll just touch up that scratch area with some more primer. I think that things go a lot smoother if your workshop is clean. So right here, I'm cleaning up all these rivet stems that I pulled. And since I won't be riveting for a little bit yet, the next step is to put the skin on. I'm just putting the tools away. That way I know where they're at, they're organized, and they're out of the way. Now that the horizontal stabilizer skeleton is riveted, it's time to start working with the skin. And this is the biggest box I have under the workbench, so it's kind of nice to, to get this out of there. They've got it packed really nice here from Zenith. I'm just slicing the tape that they have. The skin is kind of folded over on itself, and you'll see it kind of pop open as you remove the tape. I really wanted to get some competent help to put this skin on because it's large and easily kinked if not handled properly. But you know, all I had available was Brian. So Brian came over to help. Poor Brian, I make fun of him too much. I think actually a better way to pick this skin up would probably be from one edge and in the center. You can see I've got my hand on both edges, but we did it, we didn't kink it and it worked out nice. But again, be very careful with this skin because it is easy to kink if you hold it wrong or, or bend it wrong. Once the skin was in place, the idea was to put some Clecos in the aft spar to hold the skin to the skeleton. And what was kind of funny is, we put the skin on, started adding a bunch of Clecos in the spar, and I noticed that some of the holes weren't lining up properly and the skin was buckling just a little bit. And then we realized we had the skin on off center. It was about two inches off center. So once we actually got it on center, all the holes lined up absolutely perfectly. Now you can see I flipped over the horizontal stabilizer. It is now upside down. It is sitting on two level two by fours. 
and I'm going to talk about all that in the next video. I like keeping these videos between 10 and 15 minutes long because I like shorter videos and these little bit quicker videos are easier for me to edit. I don't have to. All right, so if you guys are building an airplane, leave a comment below and let me know what you're building. Are you building a Zenith or some other airplane? Let me know. I'm kind of curious if you guys are actually building or just kind of watching this build. So other than that, I'll see some of you guys at the Zenith fly-in. For the rest of you, we'll see you on episode four.